Good evening. I'm ready to get started. Uh, Joe, just just join in when when you're ready. No, no, no it's, it's good to hear everybody uh, uh, talking and catching up. And uh, we're going to go ahead and begin our worship service. We'll, we'll start with some announcements uh, first, and uh, making sure we remember uh, to you know, one of the things that we get to do to, to pray and, and uh, know that we can uh, pray and uh, we've got God that's listening to us and uh, he only created the entire universe so uh, he, he's, he's got some power that, uh, that we don't have so it's good to be able to, to pray to him always and of course we have so much to be able to pray for I encourage to pray for our leaders our, our fellow Christians that are out there that suffering just because they're Christians we have uh, the works that we're up close and personal with uh, again the Costa Rica and India and Kenya and then, of course, those around the world uh, that are that are just trying to, uh, to to live the right kind of life and, and do what God wants us to do to uh, to further the kingdom. We had uh, a, a quite a few names on the list. It's either we're going to have to go with a smaller font or move move names off. Uh, but I, there's uh, again this there there's there's also more than this. Again, if you had a chance to look at the bulletin, uh, there's more information about. Uh, about everybody that, that's here or, or some of the folks that are here but uh, we have so many to, to pray for and I'll, I'll throw in one more uh, Jeremy's on the road again um, he's recuperated-ish from uh, his uh, wisdom teeth surgery he's still doing swell he still looks more bruised now there's a nice uh, nice bruising on the side so um, Hannah gets to tell whatever story she wants with that one I guess <laughs> Uh, but he's, uh, well, he's officially moving to Texas, and uh, next time that uh, we'll get the chance to see him, I guess, will be uh, wedding week, and then after that, uh, well, he's for sure hers. So um, we're uh, officially empty nesters today. So uh, listen, if I just start crying for random reasons, just just keep walking. Don't, don't even, no, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's different. Uh, usually it's okay we only have so many weeks and he's going to come back from school but he keeps telling us he's coming back at some point he's still got stuff there so we're kind of hoping he wants it <clears throat> but uh, again of course then all all the others that are in here again there's some more information uh, in the bulletin for for some that are up here as well and then the reminder for us to, to be able to come together when we can it's uh, uh, Bible classes on Sunday mornings at 9 and uh, Wednesday night at 7 and then worship at, at 10 and 5 on, on Sundays. Uh, if you will, uh, go ahead and grab a book. You will see the list that is up here. Uh, we're going to uh, sing, sing from the book, and we'll, we'll have uh, this uh, order. We have uh, names filled in the blanks for things, so we're, we're good to go. So this time we'll, we'll turn it over to Nathaniel. Nine hundred and ninety. We'll sing it through twice. <clears throat> you are the words in the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the mighty God. You are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the mighty God. You are the king of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. Next song will be 924. 924. We'll sing all three stanzas. Then Brother Scott will have the opening prayer. I am I no more. I am I no more. I've been bought with blood, and I am I no more. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus 
Does anyone hear anything in the Lord's Uh Next song will be on page 742. 742. We'll sing the first, second, and fifth stanzas. <coughs>
The song for lesson will be singing page 252. 252. And we'll sing the first and third standard. I am a poor wayfaring stranger while traveling through this world of woe. Yet there's no sickness, torn or danger in that bright world to which I go. I'm going there to see. Tonight's lesson is called Lesson. It's, well, no, that's just what's up there. Let's, uh, we'll change slides. We'll, uh, all right, so we're going to talk about Moses tonight. And uh, if you want to go ahead and turn to Numbers chapter 20, and we'll look at uh, well, something bad that uh, Moses did. And, of course, you know, we, we know uh, about Moses. He's, uh, he's a, a man of great faith. I mean, we look at... Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, he gets, uh, you know, instead of just an honorable mention in the Faithful Hall of Fame, I don't know if that's a scriptural name to call it, but it, there's a few different names that people throw it out there. But he gets uh, multiple verses, and we look at uh, uh, verse number 23. It says, By faith, uh, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw that the child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, uh, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Uh, and just, well, pause there a minute again. Here's another opportunity to talk about how great parents are that uh, uh, worship God, fear God over, uh, over man. And because uh, he had some great parents, he was able to grow up and, and be faithful because he learned, starting at a very early age, uh, the correct decision to make. Again, he was uh, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. He was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them and of course it doesn't mention him by name but he was uh, he was there leading the way by faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land but the Egyptians when they attempted to do the same were drowned and so that's uh, that's some high praise again here these scriptures are inspired by God and well he, he thinks a lot of it and uh, so I was able to, to put him in there so you can divide his life up into the, the three 40-year sections. The first 40 years, uh, you know, was, uh, uh, again, a baby in, in, the, in the water and, and, you know, brought up and lived in Egypt and grew up there. And then uh, 
had a disagreement with somebody and, and solved that disagreement in, in his way and then left Egypt for that to start the second section of his, uh, another 40 years where he was a, a shepherd and in the wilderness and, and then that final 40 years uh, was uh, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and uh, again escaping slavery and heading towards the promised land. And in that third section of the 40 years, that's kind of where we're going to be tonight, it's when he was leading uh, the children of Israel in the wilderness, he commits a sin. And, and as soon as he does, God says, well, okay, you did that wrong, and here's your punishment. And his punishment was he wasn't going to be able to, to head towards Canaan. I mean, this is, he was, he was leading the way, he probably had a vision of, of what it would look like. Probably had, you know, this is how it's going to look when we finally make it there. God's people. And I'm, I'm going to lead them. And, well, they got to see it. He just didn't get to set foot in it. And so what I want to do is look at this sin and look at why, well, it seems to be a pretty big one. It, was, it had some serious consequences. Not so serious that it kept him out because he was able to uh, make things right with God. Of course, we see uh, Moses show up later on uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, brought his friend Elijah. Maybe Elijah brought him. But uh, they uh, are there discussing with Jesus what's going on or what, what's coming up. And so we know that things work out in the end for Moses, but something bad happened along the way to Canaan. So let's, uh, let's take a look at it. And, and we won't water down the story any. We're going to tell it just like it is. We're going to read it straight out of the scriptures. All right. uh, Numbers chapter 20, if you're already there, we'll look at uh, the first verse. Uh, the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now, what we're talking about starts in verse number two, but you know, we'll throw that in with verse number one. You know, God included it there in the scripture, so we'll, we'll talk about it again. Here's, here's one more thing that's uh, you know, piling on. Sometimes, again, we think of these uh, uh, heroes of faith, and they're just uh, you know, awesome uh, mutant uh, faithful superheroes. I mean, they're just uh, so powerful and, and perfect and everything, and what well, life was happening to Moses. And, of course, if you read all through there, again, he had a lot of stress. Uh, because at one point, of course, uh, you know, all the people would come to him to, to get a uh, problem solved. Uh, the buck stops here. Well, there were a lot of bucks that were stopping there. And so, of course, he eventually uh, got some, uh, some wise wisdom and uh, was encouraged to, to get other people to help judge so that he wasn't having to answer every single problem that, that came up and, and I'm sure that probably helped but then well his sister died uh, of course we, we remember Miriam we go back into the first part of Exodus uh, she was the one of course that uh, once mom put him out there in uh, uh, the little ark that she would uh, she followed along and she was the one that was nice enough to offer you know she happened to know uh, somebody that might be able to help raise him you know one of those Israelite women and so got mom and uh, was able to, to help Moses get, uh, get raised as a child and then sent off into the, the University of Egypt, where thankfully he didn't learn uh, as much as they wanted him to learn. But uh, again, here, here's something he has to deal with. His sister died. And so, um, again, I, I don't know how much time was between verse number one and two. It doesn't look like a whole lot of space in, in the Bible. But we don't know that, but uh, how, how much time exactly. But it was, it was around the same time we move into uh, verse number two. And not only is he, of course, dealing with the grief of losing his sister, and now, amazingly enough, I know for those of you that have read this before, you're going to be shocked to find out that the children of Israel had a complaint. Uh, verse number two, there was no water for the congregation. Again, uh, there was no Walmart to stop in and buy palletfuls of water bottles or uh, anything like that. Um, so there was no water for the congregation. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Again, it's not just, hey, let's come to, listen, we should ask Moses. He's helped us out in the past. He's, you know, done okay. 
Uh, I, I you know, remember walking on dry ground through water on both sides. I, I, I remember, you know, food. I remember getting water before. I remember uh, you know, bitter water that suddenly is sweet and able to drink. I, I, you know, he was there in every single instance. Oh, he also did it. But no, they're not, uh, you know, gathering up to say, Moses, we're ready for you to lead us into the answer again. They are there to complain. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. And there's no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. I know he probably has never seen one of these complaint department gadgets, but he probably wanted one. He just didn't know that it was exactly that. Great. You're back. It's wonderful to see all of you again. Oh, you've got a complaint. That that's new. That's what would you what, what seems to be the problem today? So he hears their complaint. Again, uh, they are coming against him and Aaron. They are quarreling with Moses, and thankfully he is able to uh, get away from them long enough to go to the uh, entrance of the tent. And it, it's not like, and they go there and they, they, they gracefully bow down. And, and it's, I mean, again, they might have slowly gone down. He, he was a little older at the time. It fell on their face. See, they, they did the right thing. Hey, we've got a problem. We've been notified of an issue. Let's go to someone who can fix it. And it wasn't like they were the only ones that knew who God was. Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. I mean, he was only extremely visible. But they went to the right person to, to fix the issue. So, again, with this uh, complaint that they had, this was uh, like deja vu all over again. Because uh, we look at Exodus chapter 17, verse number 1. Uh, this was, again... Uh, Previously, on getting out of Egypt, uh, all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on for the, uh, from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at uh, Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses, and said, "Give us water to drink." Which is, is like we, we we know you got pockets in your robe. Come on, uh, give us water. To, I don't know what they were expecting, but that that was their demand. Give us water to drink. There's nothing around here. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? That sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Uh, so Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and taking your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at, the Horeb, at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? We're thirsty. Is he even around here? Does he not see us? We're supposed to be his people. Give us some water. And so, of course, uh, they got some water. And in both instances, maybe they were just really thirsty. We'll call it dehydration. I don't know what the other excuses were because they uh, said the same thing a lot. Egypt was so much better than this place. Why would you bring us out here to die? We had it so much better in Egypt. I 
don't know how many times he actually reminded them of what they were going through in Egypt. I'm sure the number of times that he wanted to remind them of what they were going through in Egypt was very, very high. Can you see where he might be frustrated? Because, again, this is only two examples that we know that there's plenty more. So what happened? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Verse number 7 in uh, Numbers chapter 20. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation. Again, at last time, listen, take the elders of, uh, of the people. You and, and the, uh, uh, the, the head guys, go over here and hit the rock and water's going to come out. This time, he says, take the staff, assemble the congregation. Get everybody together. I want everybody to see this. You and, your, uh, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield his water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. That's, that's pretty simple, right? Bring everybody together. I want to show them who I am one more time. And so, of course, uh, having his instructions, he doesn't do exactly what God instructed him to do. Uh, verse number 9 of chapter 20, Numbers 20. Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Okay, that's one step. Take the staff, check, I've got it. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. Okay, bring everybody together. Bring the congregation together. I want them to be able to see all this. So he, he does that. Check. And he said to them, Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank and their livestock. We can uncheck that box. God told Moses, tell the rock to bring the water out. And he smacked it instead. Twice, just for good measure. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, for the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. So, again, instead of doing exactly as God said to do, Moses uh, takes it into his own hands and strikes the rock a couple times. And I, it, it's just as big a deal out of something as simple as, you know, I, I, I will, will say something as simple as following all of God's instructions. I mean, we've seen it before. When it came time to build the tabernacle, it was called, a, Moses did exactly as, as God instructed. I mean, he gave some really detailed instructions on how to construct everything. And he did it, just like God said to do it. And all he had to do was say, show me the water. Or something. I'm sure it was probably something grand that he would have said. All he had to do was talk to the rock. And, well, you know, I have the same reaction as other people. I can't believe. I mean, he hit the rock twice. And instead of doing what God said to do. And, I, and I, I put this in, uh, God refused to allow Moses to enter the promised land and Aaron. Uh, they were both there. And he, and he says to them, he says to Moses and Aaron, because you didn't believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, you will not bring them into this, you know, this assembly, into the land. Now, Aaron dies uh, in, in just a few verses. Uh, it, usually it's a bigger point for Moses because Moses uh, you know, gets, um, you know, goes on a field trip. And, and God allows him to go up and says, uh, you know, take a look. This is where they're going. This is where you're not going. But this is where they are going. And I want you to be able to see it. And so you say, oh, yeah, Moses wasn't allowed. But again, this was a Moses and Aaron thing. <coughs> Here they are as the leaders And 
and some people may say, I mean, they got the water. That was what they wanted, right? I mean, God told them to talk to it. They hit it. They still got the water. And now they're going to die. Is that fair? So let's look at why this sin was so consequential. So consequential. That's a, it's an easier word to type than to say something. Moses' sin was so consequential because of his disobedience. Again, it was as simple as God said do this, and he did something different. I mean, it was very specific. Tell the rock to bring forth water. Smack, smack. There's a difference in, in those two things. And so, well, God demands obedience to his instructions. Again, we, we look at uh, God's answer to here here is the whole assembly brought together. And my fearless leader and the high priest don't do what I tell them to do in front of everybody. Something had to happen. God's holy. God is perfect. God is just. Something had to happen because they disobeyed. They can't just say, God said to do this. Let me show you this is a better way. I'm going to feel really good about this. Because, well, he probably felt really good about smacking that rock. He was angry with the people. But God demands strict obedience. We see uh, Nadab and Abihu, of course, uh, they offered the, the strange fire as they are uh, preparing to... Uh, to, to put fire in, in uh, the, for the incense, they offered this uh, unauthorized fire, what, whatever that means. There's, uh, of course, you can Google that and find about uh, 14 million different versions of what exactly happened. We know they broke God's instructions, and they suffer the consequences because of it. And again, here's what God said about it. Uh, verse number three: Moses said to Aaron. This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. They were offering worship to God for the people. And they broke God's instructions. That means that they weren't sanctifying and glorifying God. And they were punished. So the same type of thing that happened to Nadab and Abihu where... Moses said, hey, you know, they, they knew, they should have known, and, you know, Aaron held his peace. Aaron understood. They broke God's instructions. I don't like the fact that my sons were, were killed, but they broke God's instructions. And then Moses and Aaron do the same thing. They broke God's instructions, and they also suffered the consequences. Genesis chapter 4, we can go back to uh, even earlier, uh, Cain and Abel. And, uh, of course, we see uh, uh, Cain was a keeper of the ground, worker of the ground. Uh, Abel was the keeper of the sheep. Uh, so we had, you know, fruit, vegetable farmer, something like that for Cain, and then, you know, had the, the shepherd for uh, Abel. And they were offering sacrifices, and, and Cain brought from, uh, from the, the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought the firstborn of his flock, and God was pleased with Abel's and not pleased with, with Cain. Again, you can uh, find all kinds of different uh, reasons of why God wasn't uh, pleased with Cain. We, we aren't told. Cain was. Here is what I expect of a sacrifice from you. And he didn't do something right. And so, however it was that God showed his displeasure, Cain knew. God was not pleased with it because he hadn't done what God had said to do. He saw Abel's offering, Cain did, and saw that he had done it right. God showed he was pleased with Abel's. God demands obedience. 
exact obedience. Uh, we see the last one, you know, look at the fall of Jericho in uh, Joshua chapter 6. Of course, they, they go marching around uh, once a day for, for six days, and then they march around the, the seven times on that seventh day, and then the walls came tumbling, tumbling. They, you know, they, they come tumbling down. And um, they were given some instructions. If you remember the instructions they were given for Jericho, uh, when all of a sudden they don't have any protection against the army of, of Israel. Don't take anything. Everything that uh, is going to be taken would be then given to God. That is, destroy the people, destroy uh, the animals, the, 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 uh, the gold, the silver, all that. that that's going to, that, that's holy for God. That, that's going to be taken, that's going to be put into, uh, you know, the tabernacle and, and given to the work of God. Nothing for them. So this first move into the land of Canaan, that was God's. When they started moving in other places, they would be able to take over these cities and they would move in with houses ready to go, farmland ready to go. They would be able to just move in and, and, and God was giving it to them. This was God's. It was pretty easy, right? I mean, you march around the wall a few times and the wall falls down and easy win. And so then they basically, it's like the United States Army versus the Army that's here in Sandy Cross. Well, we wouldn't send, you know, the, the big red one into Sandy Cross to take it. We're going to send a few soldiers in and take care of a few things. It's not going to take very long. There's not much to it. Well, that's the way it was with AI. You have the entire Army of Israel. Ah, there's no need to send everybody. You guys go take care of it. Wipe that one out. We'll move on to the next one. And it's a rout. Except it's AI defeating Israel. Joshua um, is a little distraught. Upset with God. Upset with what happened. And he's worried. Listen, I know we don't have uh, Fox News or CNN or something like that, but news of this is going to get out. People are going to find out. You know, here is this... Everybody was so afraid of Jehovah. And then they go against this little rinky town, and they can't even beat them. What are people going to say about you, God? And God was basically, why are you laying there? Get up. Israel has sinned. Something's gone wrong. You did not completely obey me. And now you're suffering the consequences to the point where there's a few dozen people that died because of it. And we look at, uh, of course, the fact that they figure out that somebody stole something. Achan saw some things and decided, I'd kind of like it. So we look at uh, verse number 16. And, and see that he ended up uh, taking some of the, you know, a, a coat. He took some uh, uh, some uh, precious metals. He took uh, things and, and hid them under his tent. And again, when compared to the entire town, when compared to the entire nation of Israel, it wasn't a whole lot. One guy took some things. But God demands obedience. Exact, strict obedience. And so because they, Israel, because they did not do exactly what God said, then they suffered the consequences. And uh, we see in, in verses 22 through 26, they um, make things right with God. <clears throat> All Israel stoned him with stones. They burned Achan and his family. Uh, we see back in uh, verse number 24, Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Azirah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, his sons and daughters, his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. That 
cost him a lot. It also cost Israel a lot. Again, people died because they sold. Them. But again, we look at uh, uh, the end there, which says the Lord turned from his burning anger. He didn't change, we're told. Here is how God feels when we sin. No matter if we think it's something big or not, here is how God feels. His burning anger. And so, you imagine the burning anger that he felt when Moses was striking the rock. That's not what I said to do. You're supposed to be leading my people. If you can't follow my instructions, how do we expect them to? He suffered the consequences because he and Aaron. But again, compared to uh, Achan, I think he came off pretty well. Uh, again, like I said, we, we see him again later in the New Testament. We, we know that he made things right with God and, and everything ended up being okay uh, for him eternally. But there's a reminder for us in there somewhere. Moses' sin was so consequential because of his anger. Uh, he was uh, very angry at the people. And, um, well, he didn't hide it very well. He let them know how angry he was. Uh, we have uh, verse number 10. Uh, Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together for the rock. And he said to them, Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? He didn't call them rebel scum or anything like that. But still, you, you went against God. You're going against God. And really, I mean, again, I, this is conjecture. I just, I mean, it's, it's almost like you're going against me. I mean, seriously, after what all I've done for you, and you're coming here to complain about this again? And again, we can, we'll see in just a minute that he takes it very personal. But he's angry. And, well, that doesn't really fit his description. Numbers 12 and verse 3, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. And you know, we've talked about meekness before. Meekness is not weakness. Meek is being like the, uh, the bit we put in a horse's mouth. There's a lot of horsepower on, you know, in that horse. And you're able to control it with, with the bit and be able to go, you know, let's go forward, backward, uh, really fast, really slow, uh, well, until the quarter runs out that you put in the machine. But, um, no, again, you can control these uh, massive animals, and it's so powerful, and that's the description of meekness. Moses was, was powerful, uh, miraculous. He was able to do some amazing things. He was able to, in spite of his desire not to, he was able to lead a, a whole lot of people, an entire nation. They were coming to him for answers and he would be able to give them answers. And he had this power under control. Well, except when he didn't. And sometimes that we have to, we have to be cautious of that ourselves. Sometimes we may be really good at something. And then sometimes we may think, well, I don't have to worry about that because I'm really good at this something. And sometimes that something we lose control of. And that seems to be the case with Moses. He was angry. And again, lost control of knowing exactly what he was supposed to do, but he didn't do it. The same way with Peter. He was so brave he was ready to fight. He was ready to, to well, he did. He cut off an ear, uh, ready to go into battle for, for the Lord. Uh, he was the first one to jump up and, and tell Jesus exactly who he was. Uh, he was ready to, to hop over the side of, listen, command me to come out onto the water, and I'll, I'm going to walk on water just like you. Okay, come on out. And he did it. And then some girl confronts him. 
Wait, weren't you with him? Aren't, don't you know this guy that they're putting on trial here? I don't know. Who I don't know the man. I never knew him. I, who are you talking about? I mean, he, he knew that wasn't going to happen. He even told Jesus that wasn't going to happen. Hey, everybody else, all these other guys, <laughs> these disciples, so-called, they may just run away from you. They may deny you. I will never deny you. Well, until he did. we got to be careful. Heaven's worth us paying attention to ourselves. Moses' sin was so consequential because he glorified himself. Again, I, you know, it, it seems as if he was pretty angry at the people and to remind, don't you know who I am? I mean, Google me. No, you can't do that yet. But let me tell you about who I am. I'm, I'm the leader that God set out before you. I'm the one who's helped you through all these things. Must we bring forth water? He had a powerful mouse in his pocket, I think, or something. He was, he was there to talk to the rock. Just saying words doesn't usually work, unless you, you know, unless you have Alexa lined up to turn on your water when you tell her to. But when you're talking to rocks, normally that doesn't happen. So if he would have said something. It should have been obvious to everybody, well, God's pretty powerful if he can bring water from a rock after this guy just starts talking to it. And instead, he pops a hole in it so water comes out. He at least hits it. And so we see, again, verse number 12, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me, well, I'm, I mean, obviously they believed in God. They talked to him. I mean, they... They talked to him all the time, right? They knew who he was. Oh, well, there's that faith thing again. They didn't do what God said to do. Just having the thought of, I know who God is, is not enough. We actually have to be obedient to show our faith. They didn't believe in God, coming from God's mouth himself. Because you didn't believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel you're not going to make it into the land of Canaan. Here I was giving you an opportunity to show me, to show my power, so that the people would trust me, so that the people would, would follow after me and, and my instructions, and you didn't even follow my instructions. You took credit for this yourself. We don't, we don't see that God was angry. Because, listen, what do we do? They want water. And they are complaining about it. What are we going to do? And he says, well, bring them all together. Let me get you some water. See, normally you could tell when God was angry. Uh, we see, of course, after the uh, rebellion, uh, Korah's rebellion, some of the people that uh, weren't swallowed up by the earth were complaining that some of their fellow Israelites were killed. And so we look at Numbers chapter 16, um, verse 41 but on the next day all the congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron saying you have killed the people of the Lord when the congregation had assembled against Moses and against Aaron they turned toward the tent of meeting and behold the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting the Lord spoke to Moses saying get away from the midst of this congregation that I may consume them in a moment and they fell on their faces and Moses said to Aaron, take your censer, put, it, uh, put fire on it from the, off the altar, lay incense on it, and carry it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them, for wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. So Aaron took it as Moses said, ran into the midst of the assembly. Behold, the plague had already begun among the people, and he put on the incense, made atonement for the people, and he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the affair of Korah. And Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting when the plague was stopped. God says what's on his mind. 
is sometimes God shows what's on his mind. When he was disappointed with the people, they knew that he was disappointed with them. Uh, again, this was not the only time that something bad would happen to a group of people because they were complaining. Uh, they had to make a bronze and serpent because of one of the complaints. <clears throat> Moses promoted himself more than he should have. And again, was disobedient and angry. So uh, what are we getting from uh, Moses? What can we learn from this uh, sin and his repercussions? Well, of course, uh, hey, he did wrong. He sinned. His disobedience. And, well, we get reminded in Acts chapter 17 uh, from, from Paul that God's not going to look over it. Uh, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. God expects us to be obedient to him. Because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. <clears throat> getting away from sin. Getting us away from sin is the reason that Jesus came to die on the cross. If God is going to say, well, listen, they got the water. He smacked it. I told him to talk to it. It all worked out in the end. I'm just going to overlook this. He just cheapened the death of his son. You know, the one that he had to sit there and watch for hours as he was dying in agony. And the one who he had to turn away from because, well, he had sin and God can't have anything to do with sin. The one that he'd been planning on since before even time began of this is what's going to happen and then making everything happen exactly the right way. If he overlooks sin, why do he even send Jesus in the first place? Why not just overlook the sin? He can't. He's holy. He's righteous. He's just. Hebrews chapter 5, again, although he was a son, uh, Jesus, uh, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Again, Jesus asked if there was a different way for us to be able to have freedom from sin. Let this cup pass from me, but, but not my will. Let, let yours be done. Jesus understood what it meant to be obedient to God no matter what. And his no matter what was huge. It meant his death. And not just, I'm sorry you feel bad today and you're going to die tomorrow and kind of ease off into death. He was facing something, again, that was excruciating. First Corinthians 10 and verse 12, again, this is a reminder of, of you know, what happened to Moses? Uh, he had all this power, and then he had all this complaining, and he was like, "I'm just going to take care of this. I'm going to beat this rock into submission. Get some water out of these whining complainers." Paul told the church in Corinth, "Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. God's faithful; He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability." With the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Moses was tempted to take matters into his own hand. Don't you think the devil was very excited about the fact that God's man disobeyed God in front of everybody? Well, if I can figure out some way to get the children of Israel to just be wiped out, well, that, that messes up God's plan because... The Savior is supposed to come through these people. So if they're all bad, they all end up being destroyed, I win. Moses faced temptation, and he failed this time. Where before, of course, you know, we, we read, I mean, he faced temptation there in Egypt. I mean, 
way more money than the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. I mean, they had more than a big check waiting on him. They had just rooms full of, of cash and prizes and gold and things, probably cats and corn and rice and stuff. But they had all of these things, and it was going to be his. And he said, no, 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 no. God is worth more than all of this. Heaven is worth more than all of this. Talk to the rock. I think I'll hit it. Sometimes it's the little things. Again, that we know that we may not answer correctly if we're not watching ourselves. Uh, 1 Peter 4 and, and verse 7, uh, The end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This me generation that we're in is really, really bad about, hey, did you see what I just did? Hey, somebody video me helping this poor person out so I can post it online. Hey, here's how much money that I gave. Hey, uh, listen, I was in line at Walmart and somebody needed uh, help uh, making uh, you know, the, the rest of their bill. That, so I went ahead and paid it. I'm just sharing that just so other people will do it too. And to toot my horn. And so over and over and over again, people say, how, look how great I am. And God said, listen, I, yes, you need to keep doing all those awesome things. That's wonderful. Who should be getting the glory? You're doing that because, well, those are my instructions to you. You're just following my orders. You're just being obedient to me. Let's give God the glory. Moses didn't, and he suffered the consequences Aren't we going to learn from him? Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 31. Again, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And again, you know, just because Moses knew the right answer didn't mean that he gave it. And obviously in this particular case, he did not. And normally he did. Over and over again, we see how faithful. You know, I mean, again, he's, he's there in Hebrews 11. He, he was a, a great, great man. But he wasn't perfect. And he could have done the right thing. Easily. Just move his lips. He had a better way. One that made him feel better, probably for just a very short amount of time. In James 3, verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. We, we need to make sure that, again, as we are as we are teaching, and we talked about some of that this morning as parents, as those who are even teaching some of our, our young children, we can just be living life and teaching by what we are doing, how we are living by the very people in our house. So they, they may be watching us. A stranger at the store may be watching us when we talk, when we act, when we do, it's doing it the way that God wants to, to do, wants us to do all the time. Can we do that? Again, Moses is an awesome person. God's holy, perfect, righteous, fair. It's Moses. Big Mo. He's done so much for God. So much for his people. I mean, God obviously knew him. He talked to him. He, I mean, like, again, not just through the words that Moses wrote. He talked to Moses. God knew exactly who Moses was. 
and you were close. Peter figured it out. God shows no partiality. You know, so Gentiles can now become Christians. We see in Acts chapter 10. God has never shown partiality. Here are my instructions. I demand obedience. Even if you're Moses. Even if you're Aaron, the first high priest. I demand exact obedience. He only expects the same for us. And again, he knows us. I, I talk to God. I, I've read this uh, book that he left for me. I, I have I have seen him in my life. But just because he knows me and I know him doesn't give me a get out of sin free card. I can just, you know, make my own decisions and go along and God's going to be okay with that. We'll just kind of overlook that. And as much as the world may feel that that's how God is, he keeps saying over and over again, that's not me. Is that how we live? Knowing that God shows no partiality. Because our eternal life, our eternal destination depends on us knowing it, understanding it, and acting like it, living like it, making decisions like it. So tonight we have an opportunity to be able to make a decision like it. We're going to sing a song to encourage us to do what God says to do. He has told us he is preparing a place for us, and, and we know the way to get there. We, we obey the gospel. We live our life as a Christian. And we keep sin out of our life. Do we trust him to get us to heaven? Because then we have the second part of that title of the song we're going to sing. We may trust him completely. We also need to obey him. We need to live as he wants us to live. And tonight, if there's something that we can do to encourage you to do just that, to follow his instructions completely and get sin out of our lives, we'd love to be able to help do that, even as we stand and sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way while we do.